Thessalonians chapter 1, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 is where we'll be this morning. The question before us, I like to give a question, I've been doing that recently, it's been a helpful way to develop a sermon. The question before us uh, this morning, a little different than the one in your bulletin, basically how do we testify? As God's people, how do we testify? How do we witness, how do we provide evidence for God's right judgment, the Lord's right judgment? So how do we testify to the Lord's right judgment. Paul's going to address this issue and this question in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, which he, is a letter he writes to the church in Thessalonica, who, if you've been with us through our study of 1 Thessalonians, has really suffered greatly at the hands of persecutors. There are those who would oppose the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, would oppose them meeting together in spirit and in truth, would oppose them serving the Lord as the one and only God, would oppose them saying that God is alone, the God of all creation. The world and the the persecutors who oppose the Christians standing in the presence of God in absolute truth. The Word of God is revealed to us in the certainty of Christ Jesus our Lord, who is Himself, the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through Him. Second letter Paul writes after the first letter, not long after the first letter, but after he received another report, primarily of some questions and some issues in the congregation. There were those who were leading the congregation astray. There were questions over whether or not the Lord had returned and established His kingdom. And there were those who lived in the congregation who were idle, busybodies, gossips, not serving the Lord, not being busy about the Lord's work and busy about their lives and doing what God has called them to do and serving in a way that is bringing might and bringing glory to God with all of their might. They're caused in trouble. And Paul writes to address these issues. So with that said, let us turn our attention to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers, as is right, because your faith is growing abundantly and the love of every one of you for one another is increasing. Therefore, we, we ourselves boast about you in the churches of God for your steadfastness and faith in all your persecutions and in the afflictions that you are now enduring. This is evidence of the righteous judgment of God, that you may be considered worthy of the kingdom of God, for which you are also suffering, since indeed God considers it just to repay with affliction those who afflict you and to grant relief to you who are afflicted as well as to us. When the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with His mighty angels, in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know our Lord, do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. They will suffer the punishment of eternal de- destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His might. When he comes on that day to be glorified in his saints and to be marveled at among all who have believed, because our testimony to you was believed. To this end, we always pray for you, that our God may make you worthy of his calling and may fulfill every resolve for every good and good and every work of faith by his power, so that the name of our Lord Jesus may be glorified in you and you in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading and hearing of his word, and I apologize for my struggles to get through it. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your grace this morning. We thank you for this word, and we pray that you will teach us from it and help us as we follow you. For it is in Christ we pray. Amen. Before I dive too deeply into the message, let me just remind us that this is a letter. Paul is writing a letter of thanksgiving, uh, commendation, but also a letter of instruction to this congregation. So therefore, it is written in that way. I'm going to approach it a little differently this morning to help us try to grab a hold of what God is teaching through Paul here for us and to that congregation. We'll see it from the context of answering the question, how do we testify But what we note in this with reference to the way Paul writes is it's a letter that he writes to affirm this congregation and to say he gives thanks for them and the way they testify to God's right judgment and the way they endure the hardships through faith 
the way they have chosen to follow God, and the way that they are seeking to grow in sanctification and good works that are pleasing unto the Lord. And so basically to answer the question, how do we grow and how do we testify to God's right judgment, especially in the end of time, is that one, we endure suffering through faith. Two, we choose to follow Christ. And three, we grow in sanctification and increase in our doing of good works to the glory of God. We'll come back to those three points of application. But before we do any of that, let me explain to us why we are called to testify to the glory and the majesty of God, in particular with reference to His right judgment. Throughout the Bible, and particularly the New Testament, but throughout the Bible, we are told that the people of God have a primary purpose. As our children told us, that primary purpose is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever, but as they specifically said, is to worship God. In our worshiping of God, we ascribe to Him the glory that is due to His name. We make it known to the world. That is the reason for which we have been saved. We have been saved to live in a right relationship with God, to worship Him and to testify to His glory and His majesty and to make it known to the world. As we gather here today, we are making known publicly to those on the outside and to the world that God is worthy of our praise. We are also sending this out in various media forms through the radio and through the internet to make known to the world that God is worthy of our praise. And where do we get that understanding? Well, we get that understanding throughout the pages of the Bible, but let me give you a few examples. Old Testament, Isaiah chapter 43, beginning in verse 8. God calls, or through Isaiah, calls to the people of Israel to do this. Bring out the people who are blind, yet have eyes who are deaf yet have ears. In other words, those who don't know the Lord, those who are blinded spiritually from hearing the word, from seeing God and from hearing God's word. All the nations gather together and the people's assembly, assemble. Who among them can declare this and show us the former things? Let them bring their witness to prove them right. And let them hear and say it is true. God's saying, let all the nations come and make known to you why they worship the gods they worship. But then he says this to the people of Israel. You are my witnesses, declares the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me no God was formed, nor shall there be any God after me. I, I am the Lord, and besides me there is no Savior. I declared and saved and proclaimed, when there was no strange God among you, you are my witnesses, declares the Lord, and I am God. And So God says to the people of Israel, His people, who have been called by His name, who have received the sign of circumcision, who have received the Word of God revealed to them, and had the privilege of living in relationship with Him, He says to them, You are my witnesses to the world around you. This prophecy is uttered to them in a time when they had failed to be good witnesses for the Lord. They had turned and followed after gods of the nations. And God says, come and reason with me. Come and see me. Come and let them bring. And you bring all your justifications for the worship that you give. And then let me show you who I am. And this people was called to be the witness of God to the world of His glory, of His majesty, and of His might. Of course, from the New Testament onward, we find Jesus saying these things in Matthew chapter 5. He says this in the Sermon on the Mount. You're familiar with these words, no doubt. Matthew chapter 5, beginning in verse 16, he says this. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. To his disciples, to those who have received the call, come and follow me, he says, make your lights shine brightly so that others may see and come and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. He tells the disciples in Acts chapter 1 that when they receive the Holy Spirit, they will receive power and they will go forward and be His witnesses in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but they will be His witnesses into Jerusalem, Judea, and to the ends of the earth. Paul in Acts 22 talks about how he was saved by the grace and mercy of God on his way to Damascus to persecute the church. And God in the risen Christ says to him, you will be my witness to testify of all that I have done in the world around you. 
going on through the rest of the New Testament. He gives countless examples. First Peter says, always be ready to give an answer in season for the hope that lies within you. We are called by God to be his witnesses. Jesus, as one of our children reminded us, told his disciples, when I ascend to heaven, I want you to go and therefore into all the world, into the nations and making disciples of all the nations, baptizing them to in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey all that I've commanded you. The church of Jesus Christ exists to worship God and to testify to His character, to His glory. In the particular reference to 2 Thessalonians, this congregation was testifying to the right judgment of God on the world. Now, God's right judgment is an important concept for Paul in 1 and 2 Thessalonians, but certainly throughout the whole, the whole of Paul's letters, all of his epistles. It's a big, big issue and a big deal throughout the context of the Bible. God's right judgment is his proper execution of his will in rewarding those who are faithful and punishing those who are not. And so in that sense for Paul, in this particular context, in this particular letter, he says the right judgment of God is both positive and negative. He's writing to a group of Christians who are under severe persecution. They first is, experienced that persecution when the gospel came to them in Acts chapter 17. And Paul and, his, uh, and Silas and Timothy were forced out of town after three weeks And that persecution picked up, and it has come in the form of being kicked out of trade unions, being kicked out of families, being ostracized, pushed to the sides of communities, being punished by their government for standing on the truth that Jesus Christ alone is God, not Caesar. They've been pushed out and and objected to by those who do not share the values of the Christian faith, worshiping false gods and the gods of the pagan world in which they lived was preferred because they were constantly concerned about rain. They were constantly concerned about agriculture. They were concerned about trade guilds and economics and those things. And so they had a God. The pagans had a God for all of those different aspects of life. And the Christians have said, no, we've given our heart to Christ and he alone is Lord. Jesus Christ is Lord, the one to whom we will pledge our allegiance. And they are suffering. And Paul says that the right judgment of God will be poured out on their enemies and will be poured out for them on their behalf. There's a positive and a negative. Let's talk about the negative first. The negative aspect of the judgment of God, the right judgment of God, to which this Christian group was testifying and to which we are called to testify as well, is found in verses 5 and following. But let's look in particular to verse 7 and following. He says, to grant you relief from those who are afflicted when the Lord comes to be revealed. And then he jumps in to those in verse 8 who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. They will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord for the glory of his might. Now let me pause and say that Paul succinctly states the negative effect of the judgment of God being poured out on those who do not know him. And what he says is that the judgment of God has a negative consequence to those who do not know him, for they will be, he says, pushed off and suffering the punishment of eternal destruction, which he defines as being away from the presence of the Lord for the glory of the Lord's might. Let me take a moment to unpack that. The eternal destruction we often think about, perhaps if you are, uh, have a historically evangelical background, you think about eternal judgment in hell being a place of fire and brimstone, a, face, a place of destruction and eternal torment. And certainly that is true. Dealing with the consequences of sin for all of eternity and being punished for refusing to trust God, refusing to respond and repent of those sins. But Paul here gives us a a deeper understanding of why that punishment is so severe. And it is simply this, that those who refuse to trust the Lord, those who actively antagonize the Christian church, those who refuse to submit to the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, those who reject the offer of Christ to come and follow Him and do so perpetually to the end of their lives on this earth, will exist in eternity outside of the presence of God. Now think about this. 
The great hope that you and I have, if you're a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ today, is that we will be with the Lord both now and forever. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, Paul says that there will never be a time in a believer's life, your life, if you're a Christian, my life, if I've trusted Christ and we're born again and following the Lord, there will never be a time when we will be outside the presence of God. We will die in the Lord. We will be taken immediately from our point of death. Our spirit will go be with the Lord. We will be with the Lord until it is an appointed time for Him to return. And when the great day of the Lord comes and He will return, He will bring with Him the souls of those who have fallen asleep. Their bodies will be raised. They will be united with their bodies in the air and they will come and dwell with the Lord on the earth. And Paul says, we encourage one another with these words because there is never a time when we are alone. We are always with the Lord. That's the beauty and the wonder of heaven. You get to enjoy the presence of your God forever. The one whose presence for which you are specifically made. But those who do not know him will suffer. And their suffering is that they will be outside of His presence. They will not be able to come into the warmth of the embrace of the Savior. They will not be able to enjoy the fellowship with, that we have with God into eternity because they have been separated from Him. And they will bear the eternal consequences of their rejection, of their sin. And Paul, writing to a church that's persecuted, says, don't worry about those people. Don't you get caught up in wondering what's going to happen to them. Because I want you to know this. They will receive their just reward. And it is not going to be good. I want to also note there, though, that he talks about the willful disobedience. There is a willful rejection for those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. To know God means that we have responded to Him in faith, means that we have come to trust in Him, means that we are walking with Him and following the call of the gospel. So when Jesus Christ comes to us and says, Clint, come and follow me, I've loved you enough to give you my life to take upon myself your punishment for your sin. Now you come and follow me. He bids me to come. And the call on my life is to respond. And by God's grace and thanksgiving, I say I did that. And I trust and pray you have as well. When we share the good news of Christ, when we encourage people to follow Jesus, when we talk to them, we should be saying, why don't you come and place your faith in Christ? God loves you. He gave his life for you. He wants you to live in relationship with Him. He wants to restore you. You must trust Him with your life. You must place your faith in Him. And when we do, we have a knowledge of God, for no one has ever seen God, no one has ever known God, but the one and only God who is at the Father's right hand has made Him known to us, John says in John 1. And so the call is to trust Christ. If there is a rejection of that call, then it is a willful rejection, a willful disobedience to trust Christ. Every human being ever created has a responsibility to repent of his or her sins and trust Christ. It's a gracious offer given to us by the God of glory, but we have a responsibility to respond to that offer to trust Christ. And when we don't, we have rejected him. And if we do that for the balance of our lives, then our lives will end in destruction and we will be cast out of His presence throughout all eternity. And so what Paul says to the church in Thessalonica is, when Christ comes, those who have opposed, those who have rejected and done so willfully and willingly will receive their just reward. So many times we get concerned about that. We just sang Psalm 73, and in it we talked about how we can be, uh, if, we, if we read the words and we kind of used it as a prayer for our own lives, it probably told our story. We can be sucked into the idea that we need to chase after those who are proudful, those who are arrogant, those who have resources, those who do things, and we don't understand why we have to live a life of self-sacrifice. Why does it seem that they always get rewarded in this life and we perhaps may not? The temptation is great. 
But Paul says, you stand firm because in standing firm, you know that your God will rightly judge the world. The negative consequence, but there's also a positive consequence. There's a positive aspect to the judgment of God. And it all comes from God and it is based upon the call of God and the authority that he has to call his people to himself. And so we pick it up in verse 6. He says this. Here's the positive side. Since indeed God considers it just to repay with affliction those who afflict you. So they will have an eternal affliction. Those who afflict the church, those who oppose the values of the church, those who come directly at the church. Verse 7, he says, it is God who considers it just to grant relief to you who are afflicted as well to us when Jesus Christ is revealed. And then he goes on down to verse 10, it says, When he comes on that day to be glorified at his saints, and to be marveled at among you all who believe, because our testimony to you was believed. There's a positive side for those who stay faithful. And that is when God comes to establish his judgment, he will bring relief to those who are suffering. He will bring relief to those who are enduring hardship and difficulty. He will bring relief to those who are, how are if afflicted by the opponents of God. There will be a time, he says, at the revelation of Jesus. He intentionally uses that word, I believe, when Christ makes himself known, when he returns, not in the coming of establishing his kingdom, which we saw in First Thessalonians, but rather coming to make himself known to the world as the glorious and wonderful righteous judge of all creation. When he makes himself known, there will be a time of relieving us from the burden of affliction, and freeing us and giving us the privilege and the opportunity to live in relationship with God and His presence into eternity. He says He comes to be glorified, verse 10, with His saints or glorified in His saints and to be marveled at among all who believe. To be glorified, to be made known in all the world by His saints and within the context of His saints, within the community of faith, and to be worshipped. The activity of heaven will be worshipping God eternally and to worship God eternally means to be in his presence eternally and so Paul says be encouraged dear friends for those of you who are in Christ for those of you who are in Christ judgment will come on those who are opposing you your enemies they will be eternally pushed away from the presence of God but you will receive the reward of your faith And that is to be in the presence of God both now and forevermore. So Paul says we don't lose hope. Rather we testify to the right judgment of God both now and forevermore by maintaining that faithfulness. What do we do for those in our lives who are opposed to the gospel, who have rejected the call of Christ? Because we are concerned about them and their eternity. Paul didn't say it in this passage, but certainly we can affirm it and we can recognize that our need to do something. What do we do? Well, one, we need to be praying for them. We need to be praying for them. No one is beyond the salvation of God. Paul, the apostle, is proof of that. He was going to persecute. He was there at the stoning of Stephen. He was going to stone more people and kill them for the sake of religion and zeal. And God arrested his soul on the way to Damascus. We need to be praying that God would open the eyes and the hearts of those who do not know him. We also need to be telling them about Jesus and talking about our life with Christ and inviting them to participate in the church, talking to them about how much the Bible means to us, just simply in everyday conversation. I'm not saying you've got to have these great detailed and in-depth conversations. You've just got to testify to the glory of Christ. And invite them to church. Pray for them and pray with them. Ask them if you can pray for them. Never had anybody turn that down. And then, maybe today, this has been a hard message because maybe we realize that we are in danger of rejecting Christ. Our religion has been cold and human-centered. And if that's the call, you need to understand that Christ loves you enough to give his life for you and you need to come and place your faith in Christ and you need to repent of rejecting him over and over and over and over for you will be without excuse 
trust Christ today. Repent of that rejection and know the glory and majesty and the hope of eternity. So as we wrap this up, let me point us to three things this church does to testify to the right judgment of God. Number one, they, and by default, we are to model this congregation. So they suffer trials and tribulations in faith, and we are to do the same. Verses 3 and 4, Paul says, We thank God for you, as is right, because your faith is growing abundantly, and the love you have for one another is always increasing. It is increasing within the context of suffering. Look at verse 4. For therefore we ourselves boast about you in the churches of God, for your steadfastness of faith in all your persecution, trials, sufferings, and in the afflictions that you are now enduring. They're facing hardship, adversity, challenges. You learn a lot about someone when they endure hardship and pain. You see the test of their faith. The profession of faith is only so good as the breath that comes out of someone's mouth if they walk away from that faith in the midst of hardship and pain. It's hard to see someone do just that. But we endure trials, and those trials can come to us as a result of the hand of the enemy. They can come as a result of God intentionally putting us through trials. And oftentimes they come, as we learned in Sunday school in Ecclesiastes 9 this morning, they come randomly and by chance into our lives, unpredictably. And the question is, when someone opposes the values of truth, when someone ridicules you for trusting in Christ, when you endure some kind of hardship for the sake of the glory of God, when you go through some kind of tragedy or some kind of terrible diagnosis, the question is, how will you endure that affliction in faith? Will you continue to grow? And will your love for other people increase? Or will you turn inwardly into a deep, dark hole and turn your back on God and turn your back on His church and turn your back on those who would love you and seek to minister to you? Because you can't deal. It tests the reality of your faith. And you prove in your response of faith the right judgment of God. Because gold must go through a fire to be refined. And the fire will destroy impurities. And if it is not gold, it will not withstand the fire. The question is, does your faith testify to the right judgment of God in the end times by the way you endure hardships and trials in the present? Secondly, this congregation, and we as well, must choose Christ above everything and everyone else. This congregation has chosen to give Christ above the gods of the pagan world. This congregation has chosen to follow Jesus above the values of the world around them. This congregation has decided that they're going to rest on Jesus Christ regardless of whether or not it brings their life to an end. Let me ask you this morning, have you chosen Christ above everything else in your life? Have we as a congregation chosen Christ above everything else in our lives? Are we resting in politics? Are we resting in our abilities to make resources, to make money? Are we resting in our strengths over against our weaknesses? Or are we choosing to submit to Christ in all things? And if we are choosing to walk with Christ, then we will have a reward regardless of whether or not we are afflicted in this life. And are we choosing to elevate and glorify Christ and advance Him in parts of the world where people are literally being persecuted for the faith? Most of what we call suffering and persecution is just simply the result of living in a participatory democracy or a representative republic where we're getting involved in the government that God has given to us and in given us the privilege of being governance, the opportunity of governing ourselves. People have different views I've never been persecuted for trusting Christ. I may have been ridiculed. I may have been told, well, you're silly about that, but I respect your decision and willingness and give you the opportunity to trust Christ. I've never been persecuted for Christ. But I've been tempted to trust in other things to get 
what I think I want for the majority culture that I think I deserve. And so the question is, do you trust Christ above all things? Are we being an example to the world of what it means to testify to the right judgment of God? The last thing we note here in this section is that this congregation, based upon Paul's report of his prayer in verses 11 and 12, is that they are growing in sanctification and the call for us is to do the same. We are to grow in our sanctification. What does that mean? That means we become more like Jesus every day. When Christ returns in power and glory and and, and fulfills in our lives the resolve for good works and works of faith by His power, verse 11, so that for the purpose that His name be made known among His people, among you. So are we growing in sanctification? Are our lives demonstrating the reality that we are trusting Jesus and we're willing to serve Him and live according to His glory and do everything we do for His glory with all of our might, enjoying the time we have on this earth and bringing glory to His name? Can that be said about us? Are we willing to serve, to advance and disciple the next generation? Are we willing to care for those who are ill and hurting? Are we willing to meet the needs of those around us for the sake and the glory of Christ? Are we willing to reflect the holiness and the perfection and the love of God in the way we live our lives as individuals and as a congregation? We're called to testify to the righteous judgment of God. God, we know, will judge the world with equity and righteousness. Are we living lives that testify to that reality? By the way, we endure suffering in faith. By the way, we choose Christ above everything. And by the way, we grow in sanctification, always looking forward to the day when He will come and establish His kingdom once and for all, and we will dwell in His presence into eternity. And do we care about those who will suffer eternal destruction because they've rejected God or maybe because they've never heard of the gospel? Do we plead with them to be reconciled to our God so as to bring glory to His name and to grow His kingdom both now and forevermore? Great questions for us to evaluate. May the Lord add His blessing to the reading and hearing of His holy word. May He challenge us to live faithfully unto Him and give us the grace and strength necessary to do just that. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.